I'd like to first of all welcome all three of our panelists. Uh, we have Paulina Carion, Shannon uh, from Modern Languages, Shannon White from the Center for Geospatial Analysis, and Chuck Bailey from the Geology Department. So why are we here today? We are here to talk about experiential learning. So experiential learning, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of uh, sort of gray areas in how it's defined, but we're going to start with this working definition of, broadly speaking, it is learning by doing, often in real world environments outside of a traditional classroom. So that's, that's what we're going to be talking about today when we, when we speak about experiential learning. So I, I just wanted to start with a, a few quotes. Why experiential learning? So, you know, we're, in academia, we are very, very good across the board in sort of traditional book learning. But there's book learning and there's sort of real world learning, the experiential part. This is one of my favorite quotes. My advisor in grad school always used to say this to me. In theory, theory and practice are the same. In practice, they are not. I love that quote. I had heard it attributed to Yoga Berra, to uh, Albert Einstein, to many, many people. But if it's attributed to both Yogi and Albert, you know it's good. Uh, apparently, I tracked it down to back to 1882. Because we are academics, we never leave well enough alone, because I think that that's the definitive one. Uh, nothing is so practical as a good theory. Uh, this is somebody who worked on experiential theory uh, early um, in 1945. It's a good quote. I think still not quite as good as the other one. There is nothing so theoretical as good practice. You can see that we start to get a little bit more, um, more theoretical in our <laughs> quotes here. Of course, uh, I think uh, Adam pointed out to me that Mike Tyson brought it back to earth a few years ago when he said, uh, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this all to say, that um, uh, basically practice and theory are not the same, uh, and it's good to get a little bit of each. So when you start to deal, to look at the academic sort of theories behind uh, experiential learning, why it works, how it works, um, you inevitably end up on the work of David Kolb. Uh, he has created something that is the Kolb cycle. Uh, the Kolb cycle is something that he claims we do internally without thinking about it, but he sort of formalized it. So the process whereby knowledge is created through the transformation of experience, knowledge results from the combination of grasping and transforming experience. So this is the Kolb cycle. Uh, you sort of start with a concrete experience, that is uh, doing or having an experience. Then you reflect upon that uh, experience and those observations. Then you create uh, an abstract conceptualization. You create sort of a, a theoretical model of how things work. Then you, the, the, the fourth step is you have active experimentation. You sort of t try out these theories of how things work. And then you rinse and repeat. Um, and uh, you know, when I first saw this, I thought, wow, that's a really convoluted cycle to explain how we learn by doing. But I think it actually does, there's a lot of merit to this. And so you can, have uh, when your students are having experiential learning opportunities, they're sort of going through this in their head. But as an instructor, you can also use this cycle and sort of reinforce it with how you build those experiences by adding, typically the top two, the active experimentation and the concrete experience are not an issue. The bottom two are a little bit more conceptual and it often helps to include that in your instruction. So, and we'll, you all will get a copy of this uh, slide presentation with, uh, with the references. So what, what, what do we mean by experiential uh, learning on, on most campuses? They are things like internships, service learning, clinical education, student teaching, practicums, uh, REUs, research experience for undergraduates, community-based research, field work, study abroad. Uh, the Reeves Center would have a lot to say about this. Uh, Lots of other experiences is not an, uh, an inclusive, all-inclusive list. You can also do things that uh, uh, Diana, raise your hand, Diana. Diana is running a hands-on workshop for applying experiential learning in your classes. Actually, come uh, on Friday, and you can build this. We'll have a link to this in a second, or in a few minutes, actually. So 
these are the, the types of experiences. You can also build in sort of more real world scenarios that might happen in a traditional classroom and are sort of the first steps into having experiential uh, experiences. So with that said, we are to our first panelist, Paulina Carion, who is from Modern Languages. Um, Paulina has uh, taken over for one of my favorite projects at William & Mary. It's very near and dear to my heart. I heard about this when I first got here many, many years ago. Uh, Modern Languages for years now has been running a program of medical interpretation. Uh, they have worked with uh, migrant workers in the Eastern Shore. This is an absolutely fantastic program, and I'll let you take it away from here. Okay, thank you. Gracias. Thank you, Pablo. So, nice to meet you, everybody. My name is Paulina Carrion, and I've been here at the college, I think, for 10 years. I'm beginning my 10th year. Um, as I said, I'm going to be talking about my medical interpretation class, which is a 300 level class, and it's uh, cross listed with Latin American studies. This class is um, designed for students with a certain level of Spanish because they are going to be working as medical interpreters in a very highly um, skilled uh, area, which is medical. So in the class, they will be learning all the vocabulary, the medical vocabulary, but they need to have a, a strong base of the language. Uh, who is interested in my class? Normally, students that are in approaching going to, into the medical field. They, they want to be doctors or nurses or chiropractors or they, that, that is the majority of the students that come into my class. I also have students that they need their extra last credits and they think, oh, this is a fun class and I'm gonna take it. <laughs> but normally are students that are future doctors. And interestingly enough, after taking this class, they changed their minds and they have decided that they're going to pursue interpretation as a profession in real life, like being certified medical or legal interpreters in the future. Because being a med uh, legal interpreter pays good money. Mm -hmm. So I think that that is something that is um, important to know that it surprised me. Um, so how the class is a structure. So I, I, I thought it was very important for the students to understand why we need medical interpreters in our, in our society. So one of the important parts of this, of this class is for give the students a historical framework of what the United States stands in, like who are we historically? why we have migrant workers in the Eastern Shore as one of the places that we have migrant workers, um, and what is the cultural framework. So we not only are learning um, Spanish and the medical uh, vocabulary, but we are learning all this cultural framework of what it is to be a medical interpreter. You are not just the Google translator that translate from one language to another, but understands the person, the culture, the human being that it's there. And students are required to understand this both cultures, because when you are an interpreter, you are interpreting, not translating, which is two different things. And they are interpreting um, this um, human part of a, this different culture. So the Historical framework is very important. That's why I put those images over there of the map, what originally Mexico was uh, in half of the United States. And then history, we talk about immigration issues and we talk about migrant workers and their conditions and we talk about the role of border, um, border patrol officers and why they are in in the in our border? Why they have to cross? So that is a very important um, part of the class. And also, we have oh, cultural framework is repeated, <laughs> and we then we talk about the actual code of ethics. How? What are the ethics of being an interpreter? How do you do that? 
what are the things that you should be doing and the things that you should not be doing. What is the difference between an interpreter and a social worker, an interpreter and a close friend that speaks the language, you know, like those are the very important things that they suddenly students um, in begin understanding in my class. I have students that have come to my class and they are already volunteers in Old Town Medical Center, for example, without taking the class. Just because Old Town is desperately for volunteers, they grab whoever speaks the language and then they say, can you please interpret for whatever? And they come to the class and say, oh, I was not supposed to say that. Oh, I was, you know. So they learn a very important code of ethics that trust, um, translates to any kind of interpreting services that you give. And then they learn about interpretation techniques. You know, like this is how you build up on memory. This is how you keep track of who is in the room, of who you are interpreting. Um, these are things that will help you um, be like, what is the target? Like, do not translate um, every single word, like translate the message, you know, like those kind of things. And they learn tons of tons of new vocabulary, you know, like they are going to be medical interpreters and they are going to be in an area with a lot of medical terms. I worked as an interpreter for a couple of years when I was living in Madison, Wisconsin. And I think that when Jonathan Ares asked me if I want to take over this class and this project, I said, oh my God, yes. Because the services that Virginia has versus the services that other states had in terms of interpreting are, were night and day. Um, here we don't have interpreting as a profession. Here is we work voluntarily, like people are volunteers. So um, I think this is very important that suddenly people are becoming like registered and certified, national certified um, interpreters. Um, so yes, a lot of vocabulary. Um, in the class, we practice a lot. And I say like, because you are going to pre-COVID, they were able to go to the different places where interpreters and then shadow interpreters. But now with COVID, everything is a hot mess. Um, but what we do is we practice. We give them cases and, and we have some um, practice in class prior going to this internship. And Pablo helped me um, edit one of those. And Sorry. this is, yeah. So this is one of my students. And those are the one of the projects. So I said, okay, you three, you're gonna do whatever case, and I, you're gonna entertain yourself with them. <laughs> They're very creative, you know? También me gustaría informarle que voy, voy a interpretar todo lo que se dice. Entonces, por favor, no diga nada que no quiera que se diga. También the, recuerde hacer una pausa para la interpretación y hable directamente a la doctora. Yeah, so, one of the things that they learn in, in class is that they need to do a pre-session. So these are all the techniques. You just not go into the, and then begin interpreting. So in their videos, they need to demonstrate whatever they have learned in class. So very diligently, my, the students are doing exactly what they learned. So doing this pre-session. And then we we forward, they are gonna do, like introduce to the doctor as well. And then they are going to do um, a real interpretation Can when go uh, let's go to the interpretation per se which she's complaining about her stomach ache yeah. I think that what the students were trying to demonstrate was all these cultural aspects that happened and things like that maybe not that so dramatic but those things do happen and um, 
So that is the cultural framework of this class. So students will select, a, like in this case, they were selecting a specific cultural issue that happened, but also they can select and portray a code of ethics violation in, uh, or will, I don't know if you realize, but there's a specific place where the interpreter should be placed while doing their interpretation. There's a specific tone of voice that they should use, like they should interpret with the same tone of voice, etc. So they learn all this to finally be able to do and go to this internship. So this is what Jonathan Arias connected like 20 years ago with this, with uh, Eastern Shore Rural Health um, system and they have in the eastern shore over there there's a little map they have like seven different little clinics and they students are, are able to go and do an internship and work as medical interpreter with migrant workers they are desperately for Spanish French in Creole, I think, um, interpreters, because those are the migrant workers that go and work, especially during the summer. So students go, they ask for students to go and live there at least a month. Um, because the first week is like training, and then if they, they stay for only two weeks, the first week they're training, then the other week are just working, and then they have to leave. So they, they ask to have a month of, of staying there, the organization or the clinics take care of their house and board, so they find them a place to stay uh, with families or, I think that the, they used to share some space that Vim's had over there, but I don't know, now most of the students are living with families. And they work as interpreters in any of those clinics. So there's dental um, clinic, there is a, um, there is a medical like doctor clinic and also there is a mental health clinic. So how long the internship has been going on for 20 years, who is interested? I wish there would be more people interested. I wish I could say that we have this, all the kids from the class go there. I have around three that goes every summer and the Eastern Shore is super happy for whatever we send them. They love William and Mary students. So two, three, and they, they are sporadic. So they, it's not that this is, this is open all summer long. So they can go at the end of May, they can go in June, they can go in July, whatever. They are very flexible in accepting. And they pay them. I think the last time they were paying like $20 a day. They, it's nothing, you know, but it's the experience. But at least they get some, some little money. Um, and they have their weekends off and they work from Monday through Friday and they receive support. The staff there is super nice, so they are always um, super supportive. Challenges that I find is that students have to have a car to go from one clinic to another. You know, it, this is a rural area and there is no bus system, so you have to have a car to be able to move there. And not all the students have a car. Um, and another challenge that we are competing with very fancy summer programs going to Europe and going to, you know, the going to the Eastern Shore and see, you know, uh, uh, migrant workers and maybe like horses, you know, those <laughs> wild horses. That is the exotic part that we can. So I think that that's the challenges that we have. But it works. It's it ha We only stopped doing during COVID. But then it's been doing, it's been going on every year. And when I speak with students, when they come back, they say that they've changed their lives, that they are, they, some of them want to become interpreters. Some of them are national certified themselves. Um, so it, they are doing something, so they're working. <laughs> so that's it. Okay. Thank you, Paulina. Um, we're gonna hold the questions for, for the end. For We're gonna have a group discussion at the end, so. Uh, and I mean, it's programs like this where uh, I really value that the, the college for its 2026 goals, one of them is uh, experiential learning. And, and this is, uh, I think, transformative for students who partake in these projects. So our next panelist is Shannon White. Shannon uh, was recent, up until recently the interim director of the Center for, uh, for the Geospatial Analysis. She, I've always been very close to the CGA uh, since its birth, and uh, 
Shannon just did amazing things with it, and uh, I'm so happy that she could join us here today. She does so many, she works with faculty members, she works with the community, she works on student projects, her students do teaching, so take it away, Shannon. All righty. Um, so the goal of the center on campus, we don't have a GIS major here. Um, data science has a spatial data track, and so we teach all, all of the students that want to learn about especially mapping um, and geographic information systems, but also remote sensing. And we work with faculty research, we work with student researchers. Um, I am not alone up there. Um, I do have fellows um, and we have a new director this year. Um, <clears throat> but we, we are located in the library, which makes us sort of unique, even though we're part of arts and sciences. And so one of the things that I'd been thinking about, I've been here for about five years, is some of the experiences I've had at other universities and how unique William & Mary is with the, the caliber of students that we have, and al but also those moments where our students don't sometimes know how to ask for help. Um, they, they are really great at seeking out what they want until, until they hit a roadblock and then they're not sure how to kind of get around it. So I started talking to a lot of students who weren't necessarily the, the Monroe scholars. They weren't the ones that were given money. To, you know, they didn't even know about the Charles Center grants for research. And so I started talking to them about what types of experiences they'd like to have. And um, that kind of led me down the pathway of building out, slowly building out a model for, for experiential learning in our classes and in our center. So what I'm going to talk about is how, how we started in in-class activities, moved um, into and changed our teaching assistantships slightly controversially because we were talking about this beforehand. Um, and then looking at it as a larger, broadly um, defined research group because a lot of people only think of research in that biology lab or chem lab scenario. And I come from social sciences and humanities in my background. So for me, I love qualitative research. Um, and I, I think it's really important for our students to see the other of, um, of what applied research can look like. Um, and then the last part is the fellowships and the internships. Um, when I got here, the fellowships existed um, and we had some in-class pieces that were in place, but they were usually in our like two credit, um, very elective types of classes. Um, <clears throat> so thinking through all of these questions of, you know, how do you create those experiences? How can you make things kind of a win-win for your department? Um, that's what I'm gonna go through. Um, so my, my biggest advice to anybody who's thinking about experiential learning and how to get it into their classroom is start small. Um, because, you, you know, it, it's just one of those things that you, you have these great ideas, but you have to make sure that you have the buy-in of the students and that they un really understand what it is that you want them to do. Um, I often will bring in professionals into my classroom to be um, <laughs> judges um, and critiquers of my students' work. Um, they value it way more than they value it from me. Um, they, they will take my advice and repeat it multiple times, but they hear, when they hear it from someone who's in that world, um, I find that they just hear it differently. It's amazing. I could say it 16 times and they hear it once from someone who gets paid to do GIS outside of academia and they're like, I should do that. <laughs> um, on the left-hand side, I have, um, I have several projects that I, that I build in. Actually, I wanna start at the bottom right. Um, in my class, uh, in order to have them start thinking about spatial location, um, I actually have a coloring activity. I know it sounds silly in college, but if you are given a map and you don't know where the map is and you're told to color it in, how do you figure out exactly what the location is and what parts and pieces are um, in order to do that type of work? And then I make them make a coloring page and they have to create it with social media in mind because in the fall and the spring there are national coloring book days and things like that. And so we tell them what you create, we're gonna put out there in the world. Um, what's fun about that is that sometimes we have small scholars in SWIM, especially during the writer's retreat. And so this is actually a faculty member's daughter down here on the right, coloring in a map that a student made. They really do get used. I know it sounds silly that it's a coloring, a coloring page, but it takes a lot of thought to make something in a black and white map. Um, and when they know it's gonna be used by others, they do take it much more seriously. Um, partway through the semester, I have an assignment 
where the scenario is that they work for a company that William & Mary is consulting with, and they, William & Mary wants to redo the signage on campus and all of the maps on campus. Don't know if you've ever seen a map on campus. There's about three um, that are like campus-wide maps. Um, so I ask them to realistically, I give them one week. I drop the assignment Monday, 8 a.m. It is due Friday, 5 p.m., and they're not allowed to change any of their schedule. They have to go to everybody else's class um, because this is what happens in the real world. Somebody walks in and says, I need this map by Friday. Y you can't just skip out of meetings and cancel all your meetings. You have to do it. And it's funny because I have students who email me at least once or twice a year saying, I'm in this GIS job and this just happened. You know that scenario you gave us? It happened. And I'm like, mm, don't know why I created that that way. <laughs> um, but this is where I, I do bring in folks. Um, so Kendra works for the Department of um, Emergency um, Management up in uh, Virginia, VDEM, Virginia Department of Emergency Management. And she comes in as, as well as a couple of other people and actually tells the students what she thinks of their maps, um, which is always a fun and interesting thing. And she also talked very honestly about where her struggles in map making are, um, which is, is important. Up here on the right hand side, um, Andrew Rapp graduated a couple of years ago. And Andrew, um, if, if you don't know Andrew, Andrew loves birds. He's like Dan Crystal in little version. Um, <laughs> Uh, actually, he's really tall, <laughs> so it's not really a little version. Um, but his over here, he's got bird socks on, and that's actually important to this piece. We partnered with a brewery. Um, Brass Cannon Brewery wanted to put the, um, the Frenchman's map on their ceiling, and they successfully did that. They worked with us. Um, they worked with the library and special collections to have the French Frenchman's map to actually look at the original. Um, and then as they did that, they wanted to have tourists understand what the different parts of that map were. So we had students um, in my class actually meet with them and they became a client of our class and, and they decided what story maps they were gonna create that went alongside with this map that was on the ceiling of the brewery. Um, so I don't know if I can click that button. But if, um, oh, no, oh, the actual link, sorry, oh, the link. The link. Um, so this is Andrew's, and I really thought he was going to do only birds for his, um, <laughs> it does start out with a bird. But he created, um, they all talked about it as a class. They decided who was going to do what. They didn't want replication. Um, a lot of people wanted to do breweries and, and taverns in uh, colonial times. But we, we had it pair with a lot of things about Colonial Williamsburg. So they had to pick a theme. Um, and they worked on what the designs, how they were going to be coherent, um, how long they were going to be, and the topics that, that were made. And so this is um, just one example of, of that work. So it is real world work um, and was shared with the, um, with the actual brewery, which unfortunately is closing in several weeks. <laughs> it is what it is. Um, but totally unrelated. totally unrelated to our project. <laughs> it had nothing to do with us. Um, other reasons they're they're closing down yeah if you don't mind um so thinking about just what is something in your class that, that is a real world scenario in your world um and then how do you bring someone else in to maybe help you get that point across because they will listen differently to those professionals um the next level of what we do is kind of a low stakes entry point for um for some practical Ex uh, experiences and so I start with low stakes because I think that a lot of students need to figure out whether or not they really do like what they're trying and rather than committing to an entire lab for an entire year and hate it three weeks in um, we do a one credit one credit per semester experience but they can take it multiple times I actually am thinking about changing a little bit of this for for one of these opportunities so our 425 is mentored teaching in geospatial technologies Reality is our budget got cut. We used to te we used to have two paid TAs. I can't do that anymore, um, and so we need help. Um, our TAs help us keep the CGA open at night and give technical expertise to our students in our in our classes. So in s when we determined that we couldn't pay TAs anymore, it breaks my heart. I would go that option every time if I could. Um, we created this class, and so it's a one credit class. Um, they give us about four to six hours a week. They review our labs for us and make sure that the, 
things haven't changed because data changes all the time. Um, but mostly they're there to mentor other students. And it's a nice entry point for folks who are thinking about maybe going into teaching or going into the academy. Um, if, if we want them to be able to teach as professors, we need them to know how to teach. Um, and so having these kind of low stakes opportunities where you know they're in a safe space and they can Teams message me or instant message me or call me on my cell phone if I'm not there at night, um, if there's a problem, is kind of a nice support network. It creates a support network for me, it, pre it creates a support network for our students, and it gives these experiences to, um, to RTA. So from going from two paid to now seven, um, seven in the class for credit, which is, it's actually really nice because it also opened up that opportunity um, for many more students to try it out. And most of them stick with it for three semesters, um, which is kind of nice. On the right-hand side, we, we've always had the 480 independent research. Everybody probably has that in their departments. Um, and I started thinking a little bit differently about it and having kind of these groups that are working for clients um, on small or large projects. So in the top picture on the right-hand side, that is actually James Keeter from Parking Services. Um, parking Services is very limited. They are auxiliary. We pay for parking on this campus because it pays for parking on this campus and everything that goes along with it. Um, they can't always do everything that they want to do, and they had some low-hanging fruit that they wanted to get done but didn't have enough bodies to do it. And our students wanted to know what it was like to actually learn how to do GIS from scratch. So we have three projects lined up with them. The first one is actually inventorying all the bike racks on campus, um, knowing where they are and being able to map that is important, but figuring out what were the things that they needed to know from parking services that they would wanna have in their inventory. Um, after that, we'll do signs on campus, which I know it does not sound exciting, but the behind swim where it turns to a one way if you've never seen that sign, it's really important that we know where these signs are and if they need to be, um, if they have to have some sort of upkeep to them, um, you'll now notice like every sign on campus now that I've started talking about signs, that's what all my students say. And then um, down here on the bottom, this is actually our York County stormwater specialist who deals with mosquitoes and um, looking at things like West Nile virus. She asked us if we would be interested in having students work on some raw data. She's like, I have like 20 years worth of data that we've never processed. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> um, but they didn't, they didn't have the capacity to process this data geospatially. Um, she is a one person shop in that sense. And um, they really wanted to have students look at it from their perspective and the analysis um, being driven by the students. And then she went to a conference and told all the other stormwater specialists in Virginia that, hey, I'm working with William and & Mary. And so we had three counties contact us within a week. Um, so we have four counties that we're working with and our students are figuring out how, to, how do you even normalize the data because they all collect it differently. Um, the spreadsheets year by year can change um, and what is most important. And so she actually was coming and talking to them about the mosquito traps so that they understood what the data was that was being collected. So this is another one that's a one credit. I will say the one change I would make to this is having the independent research at a 200, 300, 400 level so that it allows for them to enter it a little bit earlier. Um, we have students that as soon as they start GIS 201, we allow them into the research. Um, because we don't, we know that they'll learn the skills over the semester and there's things that they'll learn um, kind of in the precursor part of that. Do, do, do. And we have 12 this semester in our, um, in these projects. We have one that is working directly with a faculty member but wanted um, us to mentor and to also have that collaborative group to talk with one another because we don't work in those silos. The last part is the internships and fellowships. Um, we established an intern position that is a paid position for grants. So if someone else has a grant, they want some mapping done, we can hire a student uh, off of their grant money and that's actually one of the things that happens. And then we have a one year fellowship that is um, that students apply for, it is after graduation. Um, on the top left-hand side, that's Lindsay from last year. She was working with an alumni in Massachusetts who needed some remote sensing help. And all of her procedures are now published in his report to the um, Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Um, 
bottom right hand side is Christina uh, Sabocek. She is our, one of our current fellows, but last year was an intern on a U.S. Fish and Wildlife um, grant that I secured. And in this picture, she's actually presenting her, her work to the Bureau of Indian Affairs folks who are looking to replicate this model that's been created with U.S. Fish and Wildlife, which is fascinatingly interesting to see how these things kind of grow. And the top picture, um, that's Garrett. Garrett wanted to join the um, research group, but it was too late according to the registrar's office. So he actually joined for no credit and um, worked on the mosquito project last spring. In the summer, we had a VEMS professor say, I've got an REU opportunity. And Garrett, because he had started working on that project, he came to mind for us. Um, and so we sent it out to a number of students and he ended up, wor he's working now. Now with a bunch of fish data tied to climate change. Um, and he is, he's got his own budget, the $8,000 REU budget and those types of things. So the experiential learning, once you go down that path, it can grow. <laughs> um, and you do have to kind of think about the, the wieldiness of, of what you can do. But Christina as a fellow is now mentoring him as an intern and I'm the person that enters the grade. So it, it kind of comes full circle in those ways. I also am like the technical expertise when it gets beyond Christina's capabilities or they need a brainstorm. So I'm always a part of it, but I don't have to be a 100% part of it, which is kind of nice at that level. But that's kind of the model that, that has been built over the past two years in the CGA. Thank you, Shannon. Uh, so, for those of you keeping track of that long list of forms that we have for experiential learning, you will know that we've already covered about half of that list before we even get to Chuck Bailey. So Chuck Bailey is somebody that I've known since my first day here just about at William & Mary. Uh, so I won't say much about him. His head is big enough already. But I will say <laughs> that as somebody who is a geologist, Chuck is now the president-elect of the Geological Society of America. I'm not sure if this is widely known on campus, but this is a big, big honor. So Chuck, take it away. All right, well, thank you, Pablo. Um, I think I'm at the age where <laughs> you just sort of get given administrative duties, mm -hmm. and um, I said yes to another one. But um, <laughs> I uh, took a look at what um, Pablo was compiling, and I'm hopefully going to lead you on a little bit of a path about some of the things that we do in geology. And I, I started by thinking about the classes that I have been teaching lately. And they're uh, a fairly wide range of things. And then I thought, well, which are the ones that I really bring, or we try to bring um, at least kind of overtly, these sort of uh, experiential learning things into. And so I think, although I might have gotten it confused in the Google slidage uh, over the past 12 hours, then I'm going to talk about effectively the top two that are in red, sort of what we do in our senior research, as well as uh, field methods, which got some of these projects started. But I really want to start with thinking about geology department field trips, which is something that we do as kind of an add-on to bring the community together. And it's very experiential, as I think you're going to see in a minute. But it also then leads us into other paths that I think are good for bringing this back to the classroom. So I'm going to try to click this. Or Let's try it. Let's see. Oh. But this is my disclaimer for what I'm not going to talk about. We run a bunch of field courses. So um, our Geology 310 trip goes a variety of places. So here you can see some of my colleagues teaching in the western United States. And I have uh, been running uh, a, a program to Oman for the last seven years. That will happen again this year. And I would say they are the height of experiential learning, to study abroad, to be in place. But that's not what we're going to talk about today. So we're going to click and move to the uh, next slide. And just this past weekend, um, we ran our fall departmental field trip. We had over 20-some students on this trip. And we went down the James River on a float trip in canoes. And so, Pablo, can you hit play and maximize? So this is a short little video to give you a, a bit of the experience that we were having last Saturday afternoon. Um, my wife looks at this and thinks, my god, we better have a better lawyer <laughs> if this is what you are uh, taking people to do all the time. Um, and this is one of the great things about the earth sciences in the sense that we can go to the earth and study it and I think it has right away that kind of appeal to many and um, I think we've, we've been able to put this into good use because it's pretty cool to go do things like this in geology. Um, My mea culpa. But what comes out of that is something that, so in the field um, I had a piece of paper that had this on it 
And uh, not all of them ended up in the river, but <laughs> the three steps that you can see here that are called nick points are all the rapids on the trip. So the students dutifully had this in their pocket, and when we went through the rapids, we would stop and kind of pick up the detritus at the bottom, and then that led to a discussion of how did these nick points, rapids, actually form? What are the, sort of the causes, the hypotheses? And they just lived it, i.e. they had sort of floated through it. And of the three rapids on that trip, we had a success rate of 32 successful trips through the rapid and one unsuccessful trip. <laughs> that was one of my colleagues who had the uh, lunch cooler, um, which ended up in the James River. But nonetheless, we were fed. Um, we only lost our hummus spreading knives. Um, so we had to think of new ways to put hummus on our uh, carbohydrates. But I also then took this and those videos back into my classroom on Monday. So in essence, there were 20-some students that were out there in the field with us. I teach a class on Earth's surface processes that has 55, 60. It was a busy weekend on campus, so not all of them came. So my big class, boom, there they are, um, got to experience some of this with both the videos and then some of the things that I had brought, and back, brought back from the field. So what I'm trying to sort of to throw at you is one of the experiential things that we think is really important in geology is to provide these opportunities for students, but this is kind of outside the classroom, both literally and figuratively. But then some of the data or information or visuals that we collect on that, we bring back to our traditional courses. And um, had, I had power in my office an hour ago, and had my brain been working better, I would have brought um, a present for all of you. And that present, um, we'll get to that in a second. So here we are at lunch, and you can see people struggling without the knife to spread um, the hummus on things. But a question that I then pitched to my surface processes class on Monday morning is what are those things on the bottom of the river? And maybe you can see them from a distance. It's helpful, and it would have been much more helpful had I brought the bag of them that I collected. Um, although I don't know that Steely would like me to chuck them across the room. <laughs> But um, you probably can figure out that these are pebbles, river cobbles that are there, lying on the bottom of the James River right here. And from the point of view of understanding surface processes, it would actually be interesting to know how often do those pebbles move. And so in Monday, I tried to have my class interact in little groups to think about, well, how often do you think these move? You want to guess? Or could we come up with some kind of experimental design to try to measure that, all right? And maybe Shannon could help us fit uh, sensors to these rocks, and then we could map their progress down the river. But my point being that pebbles collected on the river came back into the classroom, hopefully as a way for experiential learning, even though most of the people weren't there with us. So um, these department trips, I think, are hugely valuable, and they're kind of outside the curriculum um, in that capacity, you know, just doing things that are pretty cool. And um, the other thing I will add is that the geology department just pays for all of this now. This is something we do, so it's completely free for everybody. And um, it, we're, we'll even take administrators on these trips for free. We should probably charge overhead there, but we haven't. Um, the second thing I want to talk about is actually senior research. And um, the senior research is something that every geology student actually does, uh, every geology major. And a bunch of the seniors who are working with me this year on projects outside the classroom for credit started in this Geology 311 class, which is our field methods course, last spring. And in some ways it was great because we finally got to go outside and um, do some of these things. So this is my 2022 summer research team, or many of them. There are so many of them I lose track of them at some point. They have a nickname. They're called B to the seventh, but you'll have to look online if you want to find out what that means. And we had a, an array of projects. Um, in fact, uh, Katie, the woman on the left, was one of my former senior research students who now has uh, advanced degrees and works as a geologist for the state of Virginia. So she was kind of back to help us on some things. And each one of these students effectively has their own senior research project. So we have a team, but everyone's got their own project. And what are these projects? Well, um, I've done this a long time. And, um, I wanted to try something different this year. So I actually got a Charles Center Incubator grant, and my wife thought I would never get funding for it because the title for this was Making Movies on Location. And she's like, nobody's going to take you seriously, Chuck. You can't make movies. Um, and Making Movies on Location was a Dire Straits album. Mike, do you remember that? 1980? I like that. <laughs> all right. Um, anyway, it got funded, all right, so uh, by the grace of God or something. But that paid for some of the students to be a part of this this summer. I have a, a U.S. Geological Survey EDMAP grant, where we actually have to map terrain and deliver uh, a, a map. And then I have a Geological Society of America grant, 
um, which I got before I got elected to this position. So it's not completely nepotism. But the idea with, with some of these, some of these are straight research grants. Some of them were meant intentionally to partner with community. And so the list below that are all of these groups that we have partnered with over the last year, trying to tell their public story about the geology, the place, the human history that's wrapped around that. And some of these are very close to William Mary. William Mary's Highland is one of the places that we got started in this field methods class. The Blue Ridge Tunnel has now been turned into a hiking trail. And um, so these are the places, and we're trying to do both research as well as outreach in kind of a media savvy way. Um, so some of the things that we're going to do for Quarry Gardens, we're creating a new museum display for them. Uh, the Nelson County Historical Society has many, many maps from a, really a devastating hurricane in 1969, but they don't know how to serve that data up so that the public could see it. So one of my students is building story maps that is a, are a little more digestible. Um, with the Blue Ridge Tunnel, we've come up with uh, what we hope is a dynamic trail guide, and we're now on the hook for like a full-length feature movie, um, which <laughs> means that I don't sleep at night worrying about these things. But this is outside the realm of kind of traditional science, but I think it's hugely valuable, and it's certainly experiential. Um, here is one of the sneak peek videos from uh, this. Um, and so have a look at this quickly, and um, the idea would be you can show up. And you'll have a guide through the tunnel that sort of tells you about the geology. So that short set of snips, snippets are um, from stops in the tunnel. And we've got you know, kind of a whole blooper reel, et cetera. Um, and ultimately, that's going to be packaged in what I hope is a website, as well as things you can see on the ground at the tunnel. So there'll be QR codes that you can scan, and voila, Nyla will be telling you about Boudinage, um, or Braden will be telling you about limestone. Some of these have been parked at the William Mary Geo Movies um, YouTube site. And here's sort of one of my challenges. Um, we've gotten a fair bit of press about doing this. It's been in the Virginia Gazette and the Virginia Pilot. Presumably thousands of people have read this, but the newspapers didn't carry any link to the YouTube channel. <laughs> so it's still sitting at like 133 views, which I think is pretty lame. So how do we amplify some of this stuff? And that's one of the things I feel like I very much need help with in thinking about this. You can see some of the other titles that have come out from what we do in geology. So Radon, a health health Rithk in Williamsburg was a senior project last year, and again, a front-facing view to sort of the science. And um, if this advances, oh, hold on. Sorry. Sometimes we get weirdness. yeah, I, I'm just going to sort of wrap up a little bit here with thinking about the challenges, and some of this is just me needing to vent. Um, <laughs> I think that our challenge, and I found this out over the past year, trying to both do the science and the outreach well is hard. And for over two decades, I just did the science part. And now I'm asking for funding agencies to give me money to continue to do the science, but I'm going to add on a component to it. And so I don't know that we've figured that out completely. And I think the other thing is that most of this has been leveraged by us doing work during the summers. Once our students are back on campus, they are busy people. They are engaged in so many things. And so here you can see Hannah and Nyla picking mineral grains, um, which we use to do the science. This is not the outreach part. But I worry greatly now that they're back that, you know, I only get a certain window of their time um, and that, you know, college is an interesting and stressful place. And I think that is one of the challenges that's out there if you try to do experiential learning sort of maybe in real time during the semester. Those are some of my struggles and maybe this will give us a sense as we move into a discussion. All right. Is that it, Pablo? I don't know. Chuck, is it? Oh, yes, it's it like, is. Boom. Perfect. All right, so this is, this is going to be uh, my pitch again for Diana's uh, session on Friday. Here's the QR code if anybody is keen on building something like this into their course. This is not where we're going to talk about it. This is where you're going to get started building it. So we're very excited about this session, uh, 2, 2 to 3.30 p.m. in this very room on Friday. 
Um, so if you're interested, sign up for it. Um, I, I am going to use my privilege as a moderator to ask the first question to get a discussion going. Uh, but first, I'd like to ask the, the audience something. Uh, how many of you, as part of your graduate or undergraduate um, careers, had a really strong experiential component that helped you guide you in your career? So just show of hands. People from Steely can, can show their hands as well. All right. So the follow-up question, which we'll, I'll, I'll take up with the panelists, is was that an experience that reinforced your career decisions, made you rethink your uh, career decisions, or made you do maybe a 180 on your career decisions? Did any of you, based on an experiential learning opportunity, say, this might not be the field for me? Did anybody do that? I, I sort of had one, but it was, it was even before I kind of declared. But, so you had an early one. Yeah. Excellent. All right, so my question to you all is, uh, is this something that you hear from your students, both that, that this is like, uh, Paulina, I think you mentioned it. It's like, I, you know, I thought I wanted to be a doctor or a nurse, but this is something that I really want to do in and of itself. So that's a really reinforcing sort of um, uh, experience. But have you guys also had sort of important um, experiences from students who've said, you know, I've decided that this is kind of not the career for me? Uh, because I think that that's something that in, in, in higher ed, we're not very good at doing right now. We, we are, right now we are in sort of a phase where we really want to encourage everybody to succeed and finish what they've started. And sometimes maybe we also need to provide sort of real world experiences where they might come to the decision of like, I want to fine tune what I'm doing. So I put that all to you, whoever can, might want to take it. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if I want to take it, but I can, I can give you an anecdote or two. And um, back when I started at William Mary, one of my earliest students was very gung-ho, worked with me during the summer on research and, and kind of continued down the path of doing an honors project. And uh, part of the first way through the summer after doing the field work, which he thought was great fun, it wasn't fun anymore. And he sort of changed his path. He did a senior research. And in the end, he was, he was like, thank you, Chuck. And I felt bad because I was trying to make little mini me's at that time. <laughs> and um, so what I viewed as a failure, he thought was actually very positive. He ended up you know, going to be a, a high school teacher and then a principal. So in some ways, I feel like that experiential learning and then that being coupled to sort of a rigorous academic program made him rethink what he was doing. And then, you know, he deflected on that career path. And I'm glad he got that sort of fork in the road as a, as a college senior, as opposed to two thirds of the way through a PhD. Mm -hmm. um, and I've had others even recently who, um, you know, it, they're gung-ho about things and that as they know more, they sort of know less. And it provides maybe a little bit more reflection on is this exactly what I absolutely want to do. And so I would say that, you know, one of the values of the experiential part is, you know, it, it's real. And so, you know, the warts are there, and it may help inform your decision either way. And I don't want to be overly negative. I'm sure all of you have tons of, like, reinforcing experiences. Uh, but I think that this is an important part that goes unsaid often. I agree 100%. I, I come from colleges of ed um, in my early career, and disposition towards teaching is really important in teacher education. And you don't want that student to realize that they've spent four years going for an, a degree towards teaching, get in the classroom during their student teaching and realize, oh gosh, what am I gonna change my ma major to, you know, in their second semester senior year. And I've, I've taken that forward and it's interesting to me because I've, I, we have a student that is a TA for us. She's um, in the research group and actually working with an anthropology professor. And what she told me the other day was, I'm really glad I've had an experience doing the field work in, in archeology. span I've learned that I don't wanna be outside digging. Um, that's, I thought that would be like the pinnacle of what my career would be in this field, but actually it's the GIS piece on the back end doing the analysis of some of um, what other people have collected that, that is far more interesting. And so that, that ability to say, I had this experience, eh, it wasn't what I thought it was going to be. Um, I thought I'd be able to protect cultural materials <laughs> um, instead of going out and seeing that a cell phone tower is going to be placed on top of them. Um, <clears throat> 
And then shifting that to how do we how do we actually do that through mapping? And so I think it's really important. I think the the low stakes part of it. Not every student has a proclivity towards research or a proclivity towards um, even sometimes the major that they think they want or that their parents have pushed them towards. Because we get lots of them that come in pre med because. They've said that to their parents, I'm gonna be pre-med. And you talk to them and they're like, yeah, I completely changed out of pre-med. <laughs> um, you know, that sort of thing. And, and we don't talk about it. I mean, failure is learning. And we don't ever talk to our students about how successful you can be at failing at something. Because you learn from it and you go, okay, I won't do that again. Or I don't wanna try that again. Um, let's take that risk and try, take that risk elsewhere. I feel like I, sh like you, I showed my answer to you because I think both of you have really hit upon something that I think is really important, which is uh, it's hard to do deep, significant, experiential um, learning opportunities early on, but I think the earlier you can have them, the more you can guide those people in a way that's going to make them happy down the road, which is, I, th I think, something that William & Mary is about in a liberal arts education. Paulina, do you have, what have? Um, well, my, my 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 case is a little bit dif different. Like I'm in modern languages and I teach languages and this is a special class. So this is, and I see these students that are already in their third or fourth year, like they're already finishing. And you have to have certain level of the language to be able to take this class. So my students are already leaving college when they take right. this class. So if they, well, they decided that they're going to be doctors, but then they more or less they have done the decision. Um, some of them have shifted, say, you know what, I think I'm going to take a year off and do this before, which I think it is, I love years off. Like I always try to, my advice is like, you need to stay away from schooling after you graduated from college. Are you listening to me? <laughs> Go travel and think really, really what you want to do. So um, some of them, some, some of these things happen, but uh, in my area, early, early on activities is a little bit more, like a little bit harder, but it can happen. Thanks. All right, so I'm gonna turn it over for question and answer from the audience. And uh, I'm looking at you, Zoom people. If I, I don't know if you can make that connection because I'm looking at you now, Zoom people. <laughs> uh, so, it's a small group. Feel free to unmute and ask a question. Um, let's start with somebody uh, in Zoom. Does anybody, I, I saw a couple of questions uh, come in. Families from the town, from the city, the little towns that are in the rural areas. And I think that some of them are family members, like, medical or the staff that live around um, that open their houses to the to the interpreters they are very thankful of having them so they are really nice with them so you don't have to organize those folks then, no 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 it is done by the staff over there thank you Lisa let's go to our live audience not that you guys are dead but in the room Um, my first suggestion here at William & Mary, go on LinkedIn and go to the alumni part okay. of William & Mary because this alumni is far more active than I've seen at a lot of universities. They, and in a way that they want to give back to the students that are here. Um, you may ask 20 and only get three, but at least you have three, right? Um, the other thing that I would suggest is if you don't know, start asking within your circle, and not just your circle of faculty members, but your neighbors. Yeah. You'd be amazed how many people know someone. Um, when you just pop up that idea of, hey, I'd love to have somebody do X, Y, Z. Um, and then all of a sudden they're like, you know, I don't do that, but I know someone who does. Um, that kind of, you know, in research, it's, you know, the snowballing, but it, it's actually the same thing in academia. Um, any type of not-for-profit that is in your area, they may be looking to recruit <laughs> students in the end. Um, and so thinking about them as a source of 
someone to bring into the classroom and bring them in via Zoom. Um, I send out, I did the same assignments during COVID and I brought people into my classroom via Zoom. Um, so thinking about that, and I'm really super geeky, so this may not hold true for everyone, but my Twitter universe is a lot of my professional folks that I don't know other than, than in that universe. But if I put out there that I'm looking for somebody who could spend 30 minutes with my class um, virtually, they'll actually do it. And if you make that an assignment for the students to find them, mm. right? Like, right. use that brain power that they've got going on, uh, you know, and they're, they got way more time than we do. Uh, they don't Works think harder, it, not harder. right, exactly. I would, I would add to that that I think that one of the things that when you, when you read the literature on experiential learning, mm -hmm. One of the important things is to have honesty with your students. So I think that if you're not, if you if you can tell your students, hey, this is an area that I would like to explore because I don't know as much about it as I, as, as I would like to, mm -hmm. that you're part of the team exploring this, right? And I think that they'll, like Shannon was saying early uh, earlier, that that their students will listen. Your students will listen much more to the outside person than they do to you necessarily. Mm -hmm. Is by putting yourself on the team of learners, I think it's a really powerful experience for students because it says, you know, especially if you're talking about a younger group of students, they, they think that faculty members know everything, right? Um, and so to say, hey, let's explore this together, I think is a really valuable thing to do as well. And Williamsburg is full of retirees from the federal government. Uh, you, there are a lot of groups that are that are out there, um, it, it's fascinating to me um, just how I've found connections with people is sometimes it's just like, hey, I, I know that you know somebody, you know, it, it's that piece of it. But, but your colleagues, I mean, your colleagues may know like former students. If you've been around as long as Chuck, you know. <laughs> just exactly. kidding, just kidding, Chuck. This kind of, in, including in the syllabus, yeah. panels of people that come to your class mm -hmm. and talk about what they do in their centers, offices, mm -hmm. research firms, whatever, and then they begin to connect. As soon as, I, I have a couple of those in my class, um, and I, I do it in Zoom. Now Zoom has opened so many doors, so there's an interpreter and translator in Baltimore that comes to the class, and there's somebody in New York, and you bring people, and then suddenly they are beginning to connect and maybe working as an intern, in the summer or whatever, so that is a thing. Yeah, thank you. Um, Camille Andrews on, on Zoom also suggested, and I think it's a good idea uh, to reach out to the Cohen Career Center mm -hmm. as a good resource okay. for those kinds of connections. You know, I, I would say that I, I don't know that I'm a, always a good scaffolder, <laughs> but I, um, I've always thought that, especially in the earth sciences, kind of some of these experiences, you know, it's, it's hard. It's different than what you would read in the textbook or look at. So it's, it's actually repetition. So I don't know if <laughs> you're repeating to build the same scaffold over and over again. It doesn't get any taller, but you, <laughs> you put it up and then you take it down and you put it up again. And that it's actually the repetition um, that ends up being the thing where I think I see a lot of the learning happening. Um, so. Also, also the mock mock trials, you know, like that, that video that, that I show, that was like scaffolding. Before going outside to the real interpreting world, let's do it in here, knowing like these may happen, so let's try. So those would be ideas. Yeah, I think that there are a lot of low stakes options out there that, that can be like that. That's a great example of, it's not quite outside of the traditional classroom because it's, it's, it's not in the real, real world, but you are working through situations mm -hmm. that, that, are, that are very real world. I think I saw a hand, yes. <laughs> um, I think the plan s sometimes comes along while you're doing it. I think we have to be honest about that. You could have a plan at the very beginning of how you're going to assess it and then midpoint say, no, we're going to change the plan. And I'm very honest with my students about that because I, I will tell them I'm learning alongside them 
I mean, the one, the, the project that we did with the brewery, I've never worked with a brewery before at William & Mary. Um, I didn't know how it was going to turn out and I wasn't sure how I was going to evaluate it at the very end other than could they produce what was necessary. Um, along the way though, I had checkpoints that they had to meet certain benchmarks or that sort of thing. Service learning centers around the nation actually have really good documents on how to assess experiential learning. Um, literally Google s service learning assessment and you'll find lots and lots of things. But um, if you're looking for something very tangible in that way. But the scaffolding piece, you know, goes into the assessment. Um, you know, were, were you participating in the conversation when we were brainstorming this? Okay, well, if you weren't, you need to participate in this next group because you, this next part, because I didn't see your participation as much there. And so how, how do you do that? It, and it really is up to the project. It's so different, I think. Yeah, for ISS in the class. So ISS, those videos, there's a rubric for the video. So I'm sure that they have to, to complete like this. This is what you have to do. The internship, there's no great. You do it like you are in the field doing the work. And they receive a report from, they, they sit down like the director of the, of the clinic, they sit down and they give them feedback. Like you were good at this, you need to get better at this and make sure that you are on time. So this is real life assessment, no grading. And they can pay anyway because they have been working, but um, they receive uh, feedback at the end of their. I think this, this, I think this is where we're gonna stop formally, but we, we Everybody, I think Paulina has to leave. But I think that the lesson from this is experiential learning is experiential learning for you as the faculty member running it as well as for the students. So uh, like Shannon said, and going back to my quote, in theory, theory and practice are the same, and in practice they are not. So you can start out with a model, you can start out with a theory of what's going to happen, and you're probably gonna have to adjust because you're in the real world now. And that's, I, I think that the, the students seeing that happen it can be eye-opening in and of itself, right? Like they're expecting, oh, it, in the syllabus it said that blah, 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 and now you're saying, well, we're gonna have to adjust this because of, you know, it's the real world. So uh, let's hear it for our panelists, and uh, I think uh, Shannon and Chuck can stay around for a little bit if you want to discuss stuff. Please use that little QR code and give us feedback if you thought this was useful, if you thought we could improve. Thank you for coming.